Okay, uh, so welcome back from you know after spring break. So we are uh, here, and uh, we have a couple of more lectures remaining. Okay, uh, in terms of the lecture content itself, uh, and then we have a lot of things due. A couple of things due. One is uh, assignment number four is due on twentieth, and uh, twenty one is actually reserved for like fine tuning, <laughs> fine tuning of the projects. Okay, so it's basically just trying to ensure that the last leg of difficulties or how to wrap, th wrap things up because sometimes what happens is wrapping things up uh, you know can also be hard you know if you have taken a more ambitious uh, scope of the project and so on so so that's actually uh, an individual, individual meeting uh, in the sense that individual meeting with each team separately it will be online uh, at least the you know we chose the last one to be online so we'll keep it that in case people have some travel schedules or something so so given those two slots are being consumed for project related activities. So we have basically um, two lectures, um, uh, two more lectures in addition to today. Okay. So uh, we'll be starting reinforcement learning today and hope and the plan, you know, this, the plan is to continue reinforcement learning for the next two lectures as well. Uh, with the last lecture being a merger of uh, both uh, reinforcement learning idea as well as the deep learning that you've been seeing for the you know for the majority of this course okay so uh, so hopefully the last lecture will be kind of tying things back together and, and just wrap it up um, okay so uh, let me briefly mention uh, where we are with aspect assignment four assignment four is due on 20th of april so still you know the three weeks left uh, but I just wanted to at least mention the topics. So it's actually a short assignment, uh, as you can see there are only three, three questions. So the first one is about bandits is actually, you know, a non computer, not related to computation. So it's e relatively easy if you kind of follow the previous lecture. Um, the second question is computational still related to the previous lecture from before spring break. Uh, it's about implementing these uh, strategies that we saw, okay, UCB1 and Thomas Sampling. Uh, as well as epsilon greedy, so so three of the, um, I would say we also saw exp three and exp four, but we will not look at them. Uh, so basically, three uh, techniques uh, to be uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, you you'll set it up and try to learn that hey, in fact, the last time is the best one in a in an efficient way, okay, in a way which is minimizing regret, and so that's the scope of the second question. And the last question is really uh, relevant to uh, relevant once we finish uh, the next couple of lectures, which is uh, it's going to look at one key algorithm, and that's the algorithm. That's the only algorithm, in fact, we will see, uh, or at least variations of that algorithm that we will see in this next today and the next couple of lectures, which is called Q learning. And DQN is a name for an algorithm which uses uh, deep learning plus a Q learning idea to together to create an algorithm which does reinforcement learning, which solves the reinforcement learning problem. And so the last question is about uh, using that technique uh, to balance a uh, pole on a cart. Okay. So it's, it's something uh, comes from engineering, um, I guess, uh, example. So uh, we'll try to, the assignment is about trying to do that. Okay. Okay. So, so that's the scope. And so the reason why I wanted to mention about the assignment is because um, in the next 20 days, uh, right? So assignment is due. Uh, and you also want to, you also have basically a check in in roughly 20 days because 21st is a check in with the instructor uh, about your project. Uh, and then, the, rightly, you know, a week after that is the final submission of the project. So you have only a week if you want to kind of, if you think about separate activities. So you, these two assignment and project uh, work will have to be done simultaneously, hopefully, the next few weeks um, because project is a big, com bigger component. Uh, so keep note of that. Okay, let, with that, let me just mention the goals for today. So today's objective is really, uh, it's gonna be slow on purpose. Uh, the objective is most of us are super tuned for supervised learning. Okay, any problem, you know, the moment you have supervised signal, it's very easy to kind of say, hey, these are the inputs, these are the output, I'm trying to relate, try to come up with a functional relationship between input and output. Uh, although the course, uh, you know, was trying to make the input and output more exotic. So inputs being specs or inputs being uh, images, not just that, but inputs being variable length and output being variable length. So these are not, not things that you saw in 575 or you know, other courses, right? Um, but there is a uh, difference, okay, with uh, the, you know, there's a difference uh, 
in certain settings. And, and for that, you need a slightly different framework to even talk about the problem and, and think about solutions. Okay. So it's not easy to uh, say, hey, even though here's a problem, I can still use supervised learning. You know, it doesn't fly. Okay. Uh, it will give you potentially wrong results. So the goal for today is to really do a slow, uh, you know, uh, path, take a slow path and try to understand what's reinforcement learning, what are its moving components. For example, what is the policy? What is the value function? What is the model in the RL uh, framework? And then um, we'll briefly get started on uh, what are called uh, Markov decision process. We'll, we may not reach to that, the full definition and the full uh, treatment of MDPs, uh, uh, but we'll try to get there. Okay. And uh, as I said, uh, while trying to get to MDPs, we'll talk about policies, value functions, and how they relate to each other. Okay. So that's the goal. Um, there are lots of uh, links here. I, I don't want to open it right now, but uh, I strongly encourage, I think, uh, yeah, this one maybe is useful. I mean, I, I had a bunch of videos, I think at the beginning of the uh, session I had shown, um, uh, so at the beginning of this course, I had shown a few videos like, uh, you know, Tesla driving, for example, or self-driving, for example. So this is a RL agent playing uh, this game. Okay. So it, the agent, you know, gets an input, which is a screenshot, basically a screen or frame. Uh, and then uh, given the frames, it tries to learn how to uh, move the joystick here, which is just basically the space bar. Um, and, uh, and so once it makes actions, takes actions from given the input, so given image as an input, takes actions, it gets reward, which is, uh, you know, the score that you're seeing. And based on that type of signal, it's able to uh, um, learn how to increase the score. Okay, so we'll maybe, you know, we'll keep coming back to this illustration um, because I think it gives us, you know, when we talk about policies, value functions and so on, it's always good to go back to some uh, examples beyond the slide deck. So we may come back to that again, okay? So, yeah, but the other links on the uh, lecture goals page also are quite useful. So have a look at them. Um, Okay, so what I'll do is the first few minutes, I'm gonna again, uh, kind of motivate complex decisions because I don't know if all of you have taken the elective like, uh, in, you know, uh, revenue management or, uh, or, or something related to logistics like supply chain or things like that. But, you know, decisions are generally not simple functions of forecasting uh, models, okay? So then they generally tend to, so whatever predictions you're making generally tend to be combined with other things, generally resource constraints or budget constraints and things like that, uh, in whichever domain, like marketing or, you know, ad spend or, you know, routing trucks from, you know, from one city to the other and things like that. So, um, so that's, that's a point I want to make briefly, not very technical. It's not a technical point. At the same time, um, it's a point about like, uh, you know, supervised or, or supervised learning, or I think in some communities, it's called perception. Okay. Perception problems are not the end of the and the, are not the whole thing. Once you do perception, you should also do uh, control. Okay, or decision making. So okay, that's that's the point. So I'll first make uh, that modify that again. It's going to be light, but then we'll get into the RL basics. So and, and hopefully we want to stop somewhere like get get some exposure to Markov decision processes, and we'll continue with the same deck. Uh, same lecture notes uh, wherever we left off today, uh, next time, okay? So complex decision making, uh, I'm just using the word complex decision making, it's just a, a informal way to say uh, that there's things beyond perception or things beyond forecasting, right? And here are a few areas uh, that are kind of focused on not just, uh, you know, something like machine learning or statistics, but also on decisions. Uh, these are just fields of study, like for example, optimal control or in engineering, uh, machine learning also has uh, decision making component economics and operations research their big focus on them is about policies or you know actionable things that they that you can do um, and there's also connections to neuroscience and psychology uh, with, for example how humans make decisions and things like that um, and here are some examples of uh, you know that doesn't map to the previous fields of study but uh, kind of tells you that sometimes decisions are not you know simple transformations of uh, predictions right so, you know, for example, when you have to play a game, for example, game of Go, um, or if you're doing medical trials, and this is an example that we saw uh, in the previous uh, lecture when we were talking about online uh, machine learning, where we want to be a little bit adaptive to previous uh, outcomes so that we don't expose 
a bad drug or an ineffect ineffective drug to uh, a good you know good chunk of our uh, test subjects right so you want to be a little bit more cautious there uh, packet routing on the internet internet you know uh, there's a lot of um, uh, clever techniques uh, um, uh, or processes to kind of uh, which make decision on how to how how your like for example http request gets to a website and how it comes back right um, and and ads placement for example uh, you know what's the what should be the bidding if you are an advertiser and want to bid for a ad ad spot on google's homepage or you know things like that so they are all decisions where they may not be just uh, simple transformations okay and i guess revenue management or supply chain related problems are about allocation okay allocation of resources um I guess i guess on the left on the right panel also you see some you know same examples there but all these what's common is it's not uh, uh, you want to kind of learn about uh, decision making um, but before i move away from complex decisions what i want to say is that even if we didn't did not think about perception or if we did, even if we did not think about supervised learning you know thinking about even if you knew what would happen in the future even then making decisions is sometimes hard okay and that's where uh, you would have seen uh, you know optimization techniques like uh, linear programming or something else which are just even if you knew forecasted predictions like let's say you're doing portfolio optimization right even if I, even if somebody told you here are the expected returns for the next you know 3 months or next year you still want to and here's the variance of these returns you still want to kind of solve the mean variance portfolio optimization problem which is a decision making problem right so which tells you how much weight to attach to each uh, you know asset in your portfolio right so that that's a optimization problem itself itself or decision making problem itself and it's it's not a direct mapping from hey if the return is high just take the x percent of that stock right it's not it's not simple okay. that's what i want to kind of convey here uh, but let's come back to you know uh, we don't want to focus so much on decision making only our interest uh, for the next you know this lecture and the next couple of lectures is this mixture of you need to learn to decide properly okay you need to learn the right action so in in our case what will happen is additions are not going to be complex in the way i mentioned just now additions are going to be complex only because we want to take actions given context and uh, we we just don't know what actions work out and what don't okay and so it's in the similar to spirit of um, the bandit stuff that we were seeing before okay and i'll i'll briefly mention that this slide is just trying to show um we just uh keep the chat open this slide i think we've seen it a couple of times uh it's just trying to show a panel of uh atari games okay this is a i guess uh the set of games uh 2d games that one can play and uh folks in uh 2012 actually uh, or 2013 uh they were able to demonstrate a RL a learning agent okay so it's a, it has some supervised learning components in there supervised learning like components in there but they produce a software um, which was able to play all these games with the same hyperparameter settings it was a, it was you start learning to play you sorry you start playing a game you learn what the right moves should be and therefore you you get eventually a score and and so the, with the same architecture they were able to show that it, you know the same architecture or same software with uh, you know in the sense of like the same hyperparameters can be tuned the weights can be tuned uh, so it's, there's going to be a network in there somewhere uh, such that it can, it can play for all these games okay? play well for all these games so and then you have uh, this result from 2016 uh, which also was backed by a software piece of software which involved both supervised learning and uh, reinforcement learning and so in the third lecture so two lectures from now we'll briefly mention how this was uh, done uh, and uh, so so this is the game on the left side kind of you know with extra <laughs> illustration but this is a board uh, where you have to piece uh, place white stones and black stones in certain configuration so that you 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 can score over your opponent we'll briefly discuss how what the game of go uh, in in the in two lectures from now but this is also a significant milestone uh, for an rl based approach a supervised learning approaches would not have gotten you uh an agent which could play well against humans for example okay um okay so those are just a couple of motivating things and a flappy word example that we just saw earlier so let's come back to uh, the our, our sequence of setups that we've been seen see we have seen uh first one was multi-armed bandit 
where there is learning involved and what is the learning right so learning is not exactly supervised learning it's basically um, a, a learning setup where there is no feature vector it's like users coming in they are not showing you the user profile so there is no feature vector but you still need to decide classes okay so hey this this user should i show uh, website version 1 or website version 2 let's say there are two classes okay so the choosing one of these actions is like choosing a class okay um, and uh, if you choose one of these classes and so they see website version 1 or 2 and then they like maybe version 1 better and so they'll give you some reward like clicks and uh, staying on the on that version versus maybe the second one okay so a priori you don't know which class is better so you're basically learning uh, uh, you know uh, you know i don't want to map it exactly to classes but basically you're learning uh, which action is better okay so it's so it's very similar to a b testing except that uh, your decision making is adaptive based on previous times you showed the these classes how did they perform okay so so your action is uh, you pick a class and you get a reward for the class you pick okay so here itself there is a this departure from supervised learning which is uh, you pick a class in supervised learning let's say you have test data it will also tell you the feedback will be it will also tell you what the right class is here there is no such information you pick a class you get a potentially you get a reward, reward of zero that that's only something uh, that you know about that class you wouldn't know what would happen if you had chosen the other class okay so that's there's an information poorer environment situation here so the reward is a little bit different from uh, how supervised learning, uh, you know, thought processes. Okay, supervised learning there is literally supervised signal, somebody annotated, labeled data, or maybe some future value of uh, some data set. So here uh, the reward is not uh, as strong as, uh, or here the reward is not as strong a signal as the supervised signal that you see in the supervised learning. Okay, the second thing is a little bit more closer to supervised learning, but still there are some differences. Uh, it's basically there is the presence of state. Okay. So state is like, think of it as a feature vector okay, or a context. Uh, that's what I guess uh, gives the name, gives rise to the name contextual bandit. So you have a feature vector. And so you can think of a function like very similar to supervised learning function. Given a feature vector produce here, we, we are trying to producing, we are producing actions. You can think of a function which is producing um, classes, class labels, for example. Then you can see that, hey, going from feature vector and producing class labels, I'm getting a reward of only about whether I did well with that class label or not. Right, um, and of course, you know the class. You know the reward that I get depends on whether I took pick the right action for the for the right right feature vector. Okay, so both so reward is dependent on both action and uh, on the state, and that's kind of uh, kind of like for example, think of state being an image of a cat. Then your action is saying it's cat. Then you get a good reward, for example. So you can morph, kind of uh, show similarity to supervised learning. Except I still told you the feedback is what is called bandit feedback. You are not, you know, if you say, you know, given cat picture, if you say it's dog, the reward will be, hey, it's not a dog. It's not going to say uh, your right answer should have been a, uh, a cat, for example. Right? Um, there's another thing, another way you can set this up, which is because there are two, you know, you have state and action, and then you have a reward. Let's say you somehow previously collected this information in the sense that, hey, in this state, I took this action, I got some reward. In this some other state, I took this action, I got some other reward. So you get a data set okay, where state at least is clear, it's feature vectors. Okay? Uh, you have action column, which could be classes, right? And you also have reward column, which is numeric. So what you can do is kind of join the state and action to say, hey, I have an expanded feature vector. Given that expanded feature vector, I can just directly predict the numeric thing, which is a reward. Okay, so now it's a reg regression problem where I'm saying, hey, give me an input state and uh, what action you want to take. I can predict what reward you'll get. Okay, so that's a different supervised learning problem, slightly different than what I said. Uh, but you can so if you had the data, this this state action reward data, you can you can apply a supervised learning technique to find that relationship. Except it does it doesn't work. Uh, uh, because of bandit feedback, you know, basically you only know what would have happened uh, for the actions that you took. You, do, you don't know what would have happened you, when you didn't take certain actions. Okay, so that's why the data set is not I. You know, it's okay. The data set is I. You know, in the sense that state and next state, uh, state and uh, like one one user coming in and the next next user coming in, the user profiles could be unrelated to each other. So there's independence, uh, but it's just that uh, the feedback is bandit. Okay, so the feedback is not uh, like supervised learning feedback, but it's still the difference. And anyway, so these two settings, the only difference is there's an input of a state here, a feature vector. Here, there's no input. 
So you can see that multi on one is like a special case of convex planets, right? Where the input is like a like think of a constant input doesn't matter. Um, and convex planet is a special case of RL, and that's why we kind of spent some some time on multi on one and convex planets because they are just special cases of the full RL problem. So what is the full RL problem? Uh, is this these RLs are the same? So state given a state, you know, you take an action, you as in the RL agent or the software that we write. Or you know we have to somehow we need to have a procedure which kind of given a state says what action to take. Like okay, that uh, so that part is the same. Okay, so state to action, but uh, there's an extra arrow which is saying that hey, depending on the action that you took, what happens next could be dependent on what what you did. Okay, uh, for example, if you are a robot, you took an action going to going you know ten steps forward, then what actions you can take really depends on. Sorry, given that you went 10 steps forward, you can only do a few other actions. Okay, for example, think of self driving. Okay, let me not talk about robot. Self driving. If you take a left turn, that's the action, then you literally are now in a new situation, right? And that was because you took a left turn. You know, it's not independent of your previous state and action. Okay. Um, so that's an extra arrow. This, you know, reward depending on state is, is still the same as before. But this arrow here from action to a reward now is dotted. It's just trying to show that uh, you know you take an action now, the reward may not be immediate. Okay, in contextual bandit, a user comes with the context. You show, hey, uh, take look at these ten articles, and they kind of engage with that article. You get a reward. Okay, for that you can attribute that to the user for that uh, interaction. But here, when you take an action, um, the reward can come like you know uh, ten days later. Um, so that's that's the notion of a delayed, potentially a delayed reward. It doesn't have to be delayed, but some it could be delayed. Okay, so that's why it's a general version of, I guess, this uh, contextual bandit uh, because this is relaxed here that the reward need not be immediate, can come later, and so that adds a new dimension to the problem. Okay, so contextual bandit already there's a bandit feedback, which is that you only know what to what would happen for the things that you did. Uh, then and and in contextual bandit. Contextual bandit and multi on bandit, we already talked about exploration, exploitation trade off. That's why there's a slung greedy and all that. Right? Um, in uh, reinforcement learning, it's not just exploration, exploitation trade off, but it's also a trade off between, you know, take an action which may give me low reward now, but potentially high rewards later, versus take an action which will give me high reward now, but low rewards later. Okay. So there is that extra dimensionality that comes in. The reason I'm just using this slide to mention all this is because I'm going to repeat, repeat that. Same ideas uh, for a few times uh, through this lecture. Okay, so I wanted to kind of reinforce that uh, again and again. And if you have first time you hear it, maybe there's some gaps. Uh, please ask questions, and and we'll we'll uh, you know resolve them. Okay, so with that, uh, let me. Uh, what I'm going to do next is introduce a few entities in the system. Okay, a few entities. Uh, like there's going to be an agent. There's going to be an definition of an environment. There's going to be some goal. There's going to be notion of a reward. I think you saw reward already. And so I'm going to introduce those components. So RL is actually a specific, you know, I guess uh, RL. Uh, this is a specific set of problems in the problem uh, in the problem space, problem space, uh, which encompasses sequential decision making problems. Okay, the word decision making problem suggests you know decide something, right? It could be Excel based, scenario based, you know, do A in certain scenario, do B in certain scenario. Sequential decision making is about sequences. Okay, so again and again you're making decisions. Potentially the second decision is influenced by what you did before, okay, and and what uh, you know what will transpire because of your pre previous decisions and so on. Okay, so it's a it's a version of uh, of the problem of sequential decision making, and it's very similar to the online ML setup, which is um, that now we're going to explicitly talk about hey there is an environment. Okay, so if you don't want to think about environment, just think of the world. Okay, so in some world. You need to act. You as an agent. You as in the, the software. So it's it's taking some action. Uh, so since there's an environment, you generally can get a context from the environment, so a state from the environment. Based on that, you can take some actions. Okay. This action can influence the world in the sense that uh, new states, you know, get a, come up because you took certain action, and uh, the agent can also get a feedback signal. So this is almost the same as the online machine learning, except the signal reward signal will be delayed. Uh, the action influences the future, which was not there before, and uh, and previous, previously we didn't explicitly talk about environment, but there was always an environment, and agent taking actions was the same as before. Okay. And this can have this this whole thing can keep happening in a for loop. Okay, so I only said the ingredients, but so what I'm going to do is just talk about environment, agent, 
uh, influencing the future are basically the reward uh, collection idea and uh, and and then uh, um, go from there so basically the idea or, or the problem here is is not stated in terms of learning uh, a learning for minimizing some loss okay some test accuracy or things like that it, that's not phrased that way it's basically phrased in a way where since it's coupled with decision making learning whatever you're learning some statistics some part of the you know and we'll talk about what we are learning uh, you, the problem is phrased in terms of how you can do better and better decisions okay and so you are your decisions are basically actions and so how can you pick actions make decisions to maximize a certain objective here it's a total reward over the number of you know interactions you're making okay number of uh, the time you're alive for example okay so i'll provide uh, several answers to this question and you know, a different different variations of solutions problem setups and so on but we'll look at one canonical version of this okay um so let's talk about the environment so the environment is basically you know is the second party so it's a think of a two party system where agent is doing something environment responds by doing something else okay so the environment sees the agent's action at and generates an observation st plus 1 and a reward rt plus 1 so this convention here is that at time t i take an action at and in the next time step i get a it's a discrete time uh, you know situation or setting where the next time step i get a you know the environment says hey now this situation has changed which is which or the context has changed which is st plus 1 and the environment also says because you take an action at here's the reward that you get okay rt plus 1 so there's so indexing is a little bit off here for the reward but that's kind of on purpose okay yeah so the so st is called state okay state context feature vector you want to you can call them at least informally uh, interchangeably and then um, although i'm stating a point here we'll come back to this point later which is that one simplification that you could do is to say that the future is independent of the past given the present okay and this is the type of uh, it's a, it's called the markov assumption and and later we'll talk about markov decision process and we'll make this assumption again it's just saying that you know if, if i'm the environment and i need to say hey here's a new state maybe that state only depends on the previous state and not everything else uh, that happened for example if uh, uh, if a you know self driving car is taking a left turn and, and maybe went to the left side of the street it doesn't matter you know what all how how is how it reached to this point but maybe only the current situation and then taking a left turn matters okay. so here i'm kind of hidden the actions but basically it's just some sort of a memorylessness assumption okay so it's saying only the previous only the current thing matters to determine what where i go next so now let's talk about agent um which is the second you know the party that was taking actions right so agent sees these types of things you know they basically agent sees rewards and states okay so uh, basically uh, yeah just think of state and rewards as inputs or signal stage to tell you know which give you a, give it a sense of how it can better itself okay so you can think of state as i said is like a feature vector now it's it's a reward it's not a label so it's something weaker okay i've been mentioning that uh, earlier as well so you get a reward and these are not iid okay at least in contextual manner it is still it was still you know something independent right from one interaction to the other interaction from uh, last last lecture here these are not iid because uh, we just saw in the markovian assumption uh, previous next state depends on previous state for example okay uh, and the uh, reward can also get influenced by something that happened you know several uh, time indices before so things are not independent so this st plus 1 uh, st plus 2 st plus 3 are not independent of each other they're not random. if you think of them as random variables they're not independent of each other that's what we mean and uh, agent's objective is to maximize some quantitative thing which is i said make good decisions and so so the agent wants to maximize the expected total uh, future reward okay so i'm already at time t so there's nothing i can do with respect to decisions i've taken so far so i want to uh, maximize the reward that i can collect by taking an action today at time t some uh, action that i can take at next time step they may get some reward and so on okay so this gamma just think of it as some constant like 0.9 or something it's uh, some sort of a time value of money concept i don't know if you any of you have done a finance course basically you kind of discount uh, future uh, cash flow or, or future uh, um, value right so it's just average, it's just taking the expectation of all the rewards that i can collect because that's the i can collect some reward now by taking some action i can collect reward next by taking some action and so on 
I want to maximize these numbers, or you know, if these are random variables, take an expectation on this over them. Okay. Uh, but the expectation is not so simple uh, because you know, if you're taking an action, the world changes. There's a new situation where you're taking an action, and that leads to a different reward. So there's a lot of hiding going on here, and we'll unravel it a little bit, you know, as we move along in this lecture. Okay. So agents' actions affect what it sees, um, what it sees in the future, and this is this was not the case in contextual design. Okay. And so that's what differentiates this from contextual banding setting, where contextual banding or multi unbanded, you already had to trade off exploration versus exploitation, which is, hey, I don't know what, I, what would I have if I take this action, so let me try that a few times, right? That was already there. And the new trade off here is that you can trade off current reward to gain more rewards in the future. Okay? So you can say, uh, maybe if I study today, okay, which means I'm not getting rewarded by maybe not I'm playing or maybe I'm not you know, doing something else. Um, which means I'm mean, getting a lower reward now, but maybe I'll get a better job or uh, something like that, and maybe I'll reap higher rewards later. Okay, so there's some uh, temporal trade-off that you can do. Okay. Uh, so let me briefly mention what reward is. Reward is just a for us, at least in this discussion, it's going to be just a number. Um, so a is a scalar value. It's a value you know, which, which, give, which tells a, the agent how well it's doing at any given time step t, okay? So it's just based on that current action, okay? So current action leads to some current reward. And the agent's job is to maximize cumulative reward, this total thing that we saw in the previous slide. So reward at time t plus one, t plus two, t plus three, and so on, okay? And there's also a minor detail here, which is that uh, RL uh, idea, of way of framing things assumes that everything, all, decision making that the agent wants to do can be kind of translated to uh, some appropriate maximization of some appropriate cumulative reward. For example, a robot, for example, has to pick up a key from somewhere and go open a door somewhere else. That's the goal. That's a, for example, a goal that kind of can be translated to an appropriate uh, maximization of uh, uh, maximization of expected rewards. Okay. So everything can be translated to just some sort of scalar feedback signals, which will tell, you know, which will kind of uh, help an agent, uh, you know, um, learn uh, to kind of take the, uh, you know, reach the goal, whatever the goal there is. Okay, I'm giving a robotic example because it's spatial and easy to visualize. But uh, uh, you know, yeah. So that's that's the hypothesis here. Okay. Is, is it really not a hypothesis assumption? Um, about, you know, all goals can be expressed via these uh, reward signals. Okay. And uh, what is the goal, I mean, let me briefly mention the goal. As I said, the, from the agent's perspective, they are seeing reward signals, only through which they know whether they're achieving achieving the goal or not. So basically, they, they wanna, the agent wants to select actions to maximize this total feature reward. Uh, and as I said, the new twist to the story compared to online machine learning is that actions have long-term consequences. Okay, next stage will depend on potentially what you did now. Um, and uh, you know it's also another angle, which is the rewards may be delayed. Like the action you took now, for example, you chose to study today may help you, you know, whatever, like few months from now, maybe in some interview potentially, right? So, so it may be better and uh, to sacrifice immediate reward to gain more long-term reward. So even if you know that, hey, if I take this action, I'll get ten dollars today. Maybe you'll take some other action uh, and get one dollar today because you have a sense that you know later on I'll I'll be because I took a action which only gave me one dollar today, but that may lead to certain states, okay? Because states are getting influenced by the actions that I take, so that in the future states, you know, maybe the average reward is like pretty high. So I'll, I'll reap higher rewards. Okay. Um, here are some examples, right? A financial investment may take months to mature. So even though you took an action to purchase something now, maybe later, you know, it's gonna pay out. Uh, same thing with. You know, you block opponents' moves might help uh, winning chances many moves from now. In a, in, a, in a, for example, a board game. Okay, so visually, what's happening? Again, just to you know, we are using subscript t to represent time index. Doesn't have to be time, but it's, it's a, some sort of a sequential ordering. Okay, so at time t, agent is taking action at. Okay, so it must have already gotten this previous pupil of state and reward. Okay, maybe from the previous uh, interaction. So it's taking action AT and it gives it to the environment uh, because giving it to the environment is basically saying, if the, like if you think of a robot or, or the self-driving car, it's taking an action left turn. So that's the action. 
uh, it takes in the environment. And because of that, the environment response is saying, hey, because you took a left turn, now you see a different street, which is the left street. Left street. And so here's the new feature vector, you know, new maybe uh, image of what the street looks like, the new street, the left, left street that you took, uh, turn that you took. And, and some reward, maybe the reward is, hey, didn't crash. So maybe, uh, you know, here's a positive number for you. Um, so that's the reward that you get because you took action 80. And then now the agent is saying, okay, now I'm already in the left uh, going street. Let me take another action, maybe go forward, right? And so that's the information given, you know, I go forward. And in that environment, if I go forward, I'll get a new state and a new reward. Okay, again, I went forward. So new, maybe I passed a few houses already, now a new image. Of the of the of the on this left going street, and then uh, potentially new new reward maybe I didn't crash again and so on. So that's that's what's going on in terms of interactions. Um, so very similar to contextual analytics, except there is dependence across interactions. Okay, so each one, uh, although I've broken up them into three set sets, eighty influences uh, this next state and reward. Eighty plus one influences the next state and reward. Okay. So uh, let me uh, briefly comment on. Again, differences in supervised learning because we kind of see supervised learning 99% of the time, but for a few situations we don't. And so it's good to understand and contrast between them. Uh, so basically supervised learning, if you think of this blue box here, is really uh, taking some inputs, which is generally the state and producing some outputs, generally the class labels. And the train, so here I'm calling a training signal. Just think of it as supervisory signal. Okay, uh, it's the same thing. So uh, training signal is basically you are producing some outputs, but you also know what the target outputs are. Okay, so it's an information rich situation. So you produce some output, let's say class, uh, you say, hey, it's a cat. You actually know what its target should be. It's actually a dog. Not just that it's not a cat, but it's also a dog. Okay. So that's the signal that you're getting. Whereas uh, in the reinforcement learning setting, you have the input, let's say it's still the image of a um, cat. You produce some output. Maybe it could be uh, you know the label itself, or you could take some decisions, but let's say it's a label. Then the environment says something, right? The environment's training signal is actually just rewards and not the desired output. So it just says, you, you say it's a cat, you know, given an image, you say, it's a, you say it's a dog, the signal will say, hey, it's not a dog. Okay. You know, maybe reward is zero, which means that maybe I was incorrect. Okay. So reward is actually, a, let's say it's a numeric number, a numeric thing as we saw in the previous slide. But you don't know what would happen, you know, what would have happened if you did something else, right? So, so the training signal is different, okay? And also there's a loop here, which is that uh, you can see there's a link from, hey, output, you know, you decide some action that was given, that was shown because you took that action in the environment or you get the action to the environment, uh, you know, if you think of an API type of a process, environment will tell you what the next input is, what the new state is, okay, new feature vector. In supervised learning, inputs are kind of assumed IID, so you can reorder the observations, doesn't matter. Here, no reordering, it's like time series, okay? So there's a particular order in which you're observing these vectors these state vector, state uh, objects, okay. Any questions here? Yeah. How do we actually define the agents? Like yeah, so it's, a, it's a procedure. It's like a function. Think of a function. Yeah, agent, uh, how it interacts. So yeah, how do we define an agent? Think of it as a function. It's like a supervised learning. In supervised learning, what is our model? It's a function, right? Takes an input, produces an output. Here, the agent, you know, since it's blue box here, takes some, takes some state input, produces some, um, uh, actions to take, or it could be labels as well, but yeah, actions to take, which is a little bit more general. Yeah, so it's still a function. So in fact, uh, it, it has a specific name, it's called a policy. And we, I think we've used policy before in, when we're talking about contextual bandits, uh, but it's just a policy. Okay. It's just, a, although each one is a, it's a function, how do we improve the function depends on different training signals, right? And the bottom, there's a different training signal than the at the top. So top, if you really think of it, uh, it's a batch process, right? You have supervisory, you have inputs and outputs, you have target inputs and target outputs, and you try to make a function such that given an input, it, it produces a desired target output. Okay. Um, whereas here, you don't have such a tabular batch process, okay? At least in the mental model, right? You have an input, you take some action like produce a label, that's gonna influence what the next input should be. But, so you can't have a batch of input already present with you, right? But these are both the functions. These are just functions which, given a state or given a feature vector, just produce a uh, action, basically. Yeah. Is this MDP code to uh, reinforcement learning? MDP is a way to uh, uh, talk about reinforcement learning. Yeah, MDP. Yeah. Uh, uh, MDP yeah. Uh, RLB is still uh, that efficient? 
no, here we're just talking about the problem, right? Whether it's efficient or not is a different problem. So RL is related to MDP in the sense that we'll use MDP terminology and set up to discuss the reinforcement link problem. Okay. Uh, MDP is just a way to say, hey, here are the random, how are the random variables related to each other? Okay. Uh, but you have to set up a problem. Hey, I want to learn the transition properties. I want to learn the policy and things like that. Those are uh, problems that you define using the MDP uh, form formulation, right? So we'll talk about MDPs at the end today. Yeah, but you had some. So if we relax the criteria of MDP, that's like. No, no, you're talking about Marco assumption. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, if we can drop Marco assumption, you still have a reinforcement problem. Yeah. Like the environment need not depend on the uh, previous input to say, hey, what the next input could be. It could depend on all the previous, uh, all the previous, for example, let's say you, you are a traveler and you're going to travel that site. If you have traveled like 30 different countries, um, you know, it's not just the last country which will matter how you perceive the website's recommendations. It could be all the 30 countries that you've been to, uh, which influence what, what you, what you uh, how you perceive the website, for example. Right? Uh, but there's a way to kind of, Deal with Markovian in the sense that you can you can make a new state, which is like, hey, what all of countries that you, you have done in the past in the current uh, state vector. So there are some tricks. We'll talk about them later. Okay. Here I'm just trying to distinguish between supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning, sorry, um, because it's not very obvious. Like you know, there's a little bit nuance here, and and don't know the nuance, then it's going to be hard to understand the remaining. And, and in fact, and that's why we're only going to look at one algorithm, maybe not this lecture, next lecture, for how to even build an agent like the Flappy Bird thing. Okay. And in fact, we'll use the Flappy Bird example after I introduce a couple of key concepts of what does that agent, right? What does the agent do? How is it represented? It's like a basically a policy. So it's a function which, given an input, uh, produces a output, which is uh, generally an action. Okay, so that brings me to uh, this part, which is uh, I want to mention before introducing MDPs, I want to still mention uh, the kind of core components of an, what which constitute an RL agent. Okay, not all of them are necessary to define an RL agent. The minimum thing you need to define is something akin to a policy, and that's what I think we saw it in the conditional setting as well. It's the agent's behavior function. What would the agent do in any situation? Okay, any situation, any context, any state. It's all the same thing. Given any feature vector or any state, what should the agent decide to do? Okay, so this is a decision making agent, right? So that's one component. But there are a couple of other auxiliary things, related things, which also kind of uh, can be used as, can be used to kind of um, uh, inform agent's behavior. Okay, so maybe not directly, but indirectly. Okay? So one of the, the other component, which is new, which we've not introduced before in the contextual value setting, is the notion of a value function. Okay? So value function is, uh, there are states, so there are basically feature vectors of states. Let's say there are only a few of them. There are only like 100 states, okay? Which is, uh, you know, just an illustration, but let's say there are 100 states. Value function is a function which, given a state, given a uh, state or a feature vector, says how good that state is for this agent, okay? Some sort of a score that you can keep for how good that, uh, you know, you know, how good that state is for the agent, which means that, let's say one state is really good, okay? Really good just means, high number produced by this value function. That just means informally that, hey, if that state is, uh, has this high value function you know, value, then maybe the agent should decide to be there rather than you know, some other state. Okay? So somehow like try to take action such that it can be there potentially. Okay? Informally I'm saying it, we're gonna define it in a second. And model is just, uh, this model is exactly what you think of uh, what a model could be. So here it's just the agents Agents thinking of how the environment is gonna, uh, you know, how the how does the how does the environment itself behave? Okay, by which I mean, remember, environment's behavior is, if environment is told this is the action, it will say, hey, here's the next state. Okay, now agent on its side can say, oh, let me think. If if I'm in this state, if I took this action, the environment, you know, the environment will change in this way. That's you know, the agent's internal representation of how the environment dynamics look like. We'll look at uh, through a grid world example in the next two, three slides. Okay. So let's start with actually one piece of time. Policy is the most familiar because we kind of uh, briefly introduced that when we're talking about contextual bandits. So policy is nothing but a function. And uh, this is the blue box that you saw earlier. It's a function. 
it's a mapping or a function uh, from state to action. Okay? So for example, uh, you know, there's slight distinction between deterministic policy and stochastic policy. So this is something um, uh, that you saw even for EXP4. EXP4's policy was, you know, um, stochastic. There's with some randomness, you take some action, right? Yeah, for example, Thomson sampling's policy of taking an action at a given situation, uh, sorry, uh, Thomson sampling is stateless, but even Thomson sampling's uh, uh, choose or choice of actions was random, right? So that would fall into the second category. EXP force choice of uh, action would also fall into the second category. Okay. So what is the what is the category? So deterministic policy is just saying in the in the state the function just returns hey here do this do this action right. Stochastic policy just means that given a state, uh, the, you can think of that function as like keep you know uh, producing a distribution or actions and then you can sample an action from that or the function itself can sample an action and give it to you but it's just maintaining a distribution or actions given the state. Okay. So here's an example, right? So, um, so the so let me set the example up. So this is the top view of a board of a grid uh, uh, setup, and uh, the the uh, yeah. So agents start here on the at the start point, and they need to reach to this goal. Okay. So I'm not gonna tell you how to learn and all that. We are not interested in reinforcement learning at this point. We are only interested in defining a policy. Okay. So for that, I need some minimal things. Uh, states are just going to be agents locations, okay? So because uh, you remember policy has to have input to state. So I want to say location of, so this white cell here is three to the left and maybe uh, four to the bottom. And uh, that's the location, X, Y coordinate basically. Okay? So that's the location. Uh, actions are going to be go up, go down, go left, go right, or basically northeast, southwest, okay? And rewards are kind of not super important at this point. Uh, so let me ignore that, okay? So here's a representation of policy. Just to, just to kind of, oh, what is going on here? Oh, there is a question. Um, let me kind of complete here. So this red arrow is just showing an example policy. It's just a visual illustration of what a policy look like. looks like. It's just a function, right? So any given uh, square is just saying, hey, go left. Sorry, go, go east or, or go, what is it called? Uh, go right. Um, so in this state, you know, go up, right? Go north. So that's all. So, so this is just a visualization for this particular setup. The state happens to be a two-dimensional uh, tuple saying, you know, xy coordinate. And given that xy coordinate, go left, go right, uh, go north, go south, basically. Okay. Uh, there's a question here. So agent-based modeling commonly used for simulation based on this concept. Uh, so Agent-based modeling is a different idea, so it's a it's it's not related to reinforcement learning. Uh, although agent-based modeling is a is a way to simulate uh, complex uh, environments. Okay, so for example, if you want to simulate the city of city of Chicago, uh, so you can define agents which are you know uh, students, uh, agents who are like uh, CTA employees, agents who work you know through humans who work at different uh, you know institutions. And then you can give them properties. Hey, this agent, you know, goes to school. This agent goes to workplace. This agent will interact and trade the commodities with somebody else. So, given the agent definitions, you can see the emergent behavior of how the city functions. Maybe the economy of the city, or congestion in uh, the trains, or things like that. So, it's just a simulation simulation tool uh, when you can't really do things uh, in a mathematical or a direct computational way. Okay, so that's agent-based simulation. Uh, different area, uh, very interesting. I mean, you can build a such agent-based simulation models, I believe, uh, can be used for, for example, uh, modeling the spread of uh, uh, diseases like uh, COVID or other um, uh, other uh, diseases. Okay, so you can do that, for example. So, but here it's not related. Um, here we only have one agent, at least uh, the way we are calling it. Okay. So these oh, arrows is the the policy. Okay. So uh, go uh, west or go go left at, at this state here. Is that clear? So what is the policy? Policy is kind of, I think, uh, so that's that's essentially, if you can somehow get to a policy, you have pretty much defined this, defined your RL agent, okay? And, it, and you have pretty much solved, kind of solved the problem in the sense that this is your solution, whether it's a good solution or not, to be, to be determined. Um, 
So let's talk about value function, which is a, uh, I guess, a new concept. It was not there for contextual bandits or multi-band okay? um, or at least we did not introduce it. So value function is a prediction of future reward. Okay, so it's a prediction of the future reward. I mean, you can call it a prediction of future reward, or basically uh, here is the um, definition. It's basically assigning to each state how much reward can I get from this state onwards. Uh, by following a given policy. So if you can see the definition of value function here, at least for this slide, or you know, not just this slide, but you'll see in the future as well. The value function depends on, uh, takes a state as input, produces a number, which is how good a state is. But to do that, it, you also need to tell, tell uh, what policy you want to follow. Okay, so that's the subscript phi here. So given a policy that you want to follow, like say in the previous slide, previous slide already had some policy, right? So given that policy, it's just saying, how do you value one state versus the other? Hey, is the state better than this other state? Okay. So how do we value that? Because it's basically saying, hey, how much reward can you get starting from the state and following this policy? Right. So for example, if you start from uh, this state and follow this particular policy, you can see that you actually are probably the most optimal way to get to the goal. So uh, being in, you know, so following this policy, right? Uh, being in this state is better than uh, this state. I think uh, being in this state would be the most valuable, right? So it's just a value of how good the states are, right? For example, being in the state is pretty bad, right? Because um, if you're following this policy, being in the state, you are kind of pretty far removed from uh, your goal, okay? So it's not a valuable state to be in, okay? So actually, next page has a figure. So. Uh, if you think of the rewards, right? Immediate rewards, I was saying, it's it's fixed constant. It doesn't depend on which state you're in, it's minus one, okay, for simplicity. It doesn't have to be that like that. Reward, remember, it should depend on the state and the action. For simplicity, let's say reward is minus one. Then if you are here, remember our policy was the optimal policy, pretty much you can kind of eyeball, hey, go like this, go like this, all right? So given that policy, you can say, since my reward, if, you know, if I reach the goal, one, one step away from reaching goal, then because I, if I take one step, I get some reward, which is minus one. So that's why this value of this being in this state and going uh, right is a minus one, okay? Um, sorry, value of being in this state is minus one under that policy pi, okay? So pi is anyway saying, hey, in this state, go right, right? Uh, two slides ago. So value is just a number associated with each of these white boxes, right? So the more further away you are from the goal, the value is decreasing. So, so being in the state is less valuable than being in the state. So this is a good state. You want to get to there. Okay. So it's just a concept of saying what is better situation to be in. And then later on, it will help you get, you know, later on, we'll talk about how that will help us in uh, uh, figuring out an approach uh, for the agent to uh, learn a policy. So is that clear what a value function is? It's just the expected total rate. So if you are in this state, you are pretty bad in the sense that you are pretty much a starting point. You have to uh, go quite a long distance and that's why the value is being shown is quite negative. But if you're in this state, you're even worse, right? So you have to kind of get unwind all this issue and then actually go all the way to the uh, end, okay? So you can just compare states. So states which have higher values uh, are better to be in. Yeah. If you know the policy, okay, so, okay, we are talking about reinforcement learning, but I say, as I said, here, we're only talking about the components, the, the components that an agent can maintain. For example, if an agent can maintain a value function, okay? There's some learning aspect to it. We'll not get to the learning aspect yet. Uh, this is just a building block. There's a notion of a value function, and we, I'm defining it to be, if you tell me the policy already, which means that they are pretty much defined agent. If you tell me the policy already, then I can tell you what the value of each state is, okay? So it's not something that, uh, um, I think you're thinking in terms of how would an agent learn these values or they're given beforehand or not. It's, we're not getting into that nuance yet. Uh, you know, there are some agents which will try to learn these value functions. Okay. Later on, we'll see, we'll see that. In fact, Q learning is the only algorithm we'll see, you know, in this, in this course, uh, or at least without deep learning component. And that uses a variant of value function. It estimates these value functions as it, as it interacts with the environment. Not doesn't exactly estimate this guy, but it's slightly different, but uh, the same concept. Okay. So, the, but we'll not worry about that learning part now. Let's just talk about these entities. Uh, sorry, these core ideas, components, policy, value function. And uh, the last one is a model. 
So what is the model? Model is just a, um, so how, like your representation of what the environment, uh, you know, how the environment reacts, okay? Whether the environment reacts or you, because you moved, made, made an action, you are in a new like uh, location of the room, if you're a robot or if you've taken a new lane because you took a right turn or left turn, uh, that's, that's all, you know, it, it's all the same thing. So model is basically represented using conditional probabilities. Okay, so it's just saying, so there are two sets of conditional probabilities. One is predict the next state. So given a state and an action, what is the next state? Okay, maybe there's a probability associated with it. Then uh, that is a model of the environment dynamics. Okay. Similarly, given a state, if you take an action, there's some reward that you get. Maybe the average of it is represented by this object. That is also a, a model, a, part, a, a model part of the environment. So, so these two together are, can be defined as the model of the environment. So in the sense that the environment itself could be behaving like this. So if you think of environment as a, as a, as a class in Python or like a function in Python, every time you give it an action, it'll look up, hey, what state I'm in, and then return, uh, you know, flip a coin according to this distribution, return back a next state to you, for example, right? So, uh, but you know, the environment could be more complex. For example, think of the Flappy Bird case. Okay, let's actually come back to Flappy Bird, Flappy Bird situation. So, um, now let's talk about what is uh, state here. Oh, okay, what is this? Um, so the state here is this uh, uh, screen, screenshot. Okay, so you can't really enumerate them, although in the grid world, we just literally saw from the top view all the states. Here, there's so many states, right? Um, so many screenshots, basically, or frames, right? Um, and uh, your, uh, your policy is basically at any given state, what action to take, right? Or basically jump up or not, don't jump up. And uh, value function is basically being in this state. So, you know, this screenshot along with me being here, is that more valuable compared to the same screenshot, let's say, and me being, uh, you know, somewhere else like over here. Okay. Maybe it's not valuable because maybe from here I can do a better jump than being like somewhere close to the uh, top, uh, you know, pipe, right? So, that's what a value function is trying to say. If you already know what the policy is, if you already tell me every state, what are you going to do? I can tell you what the value uh, of being in some state versus the other is. Okay, so far, that's the definition. So that's what we have seen so far. And model is, you know, behind the scenes, you know, how this flappy bird environment is behaving, there could be some mechanics, game mechanics. Okay, But I, as the agent, can maintain, for example, the conditional probability distribution. Okay, so what is the probability of seeing a different screen uh, given the previous screen and I take a up, up you know, up jump, for example, I can make that, I can keep a representation like that, irrespective of whether behind the scenes it was actually using conditional probabilities or not. Okay. Behind the scenes as in the environment here, for example, the Flappy Bird uh, game engine could be implemented in any way, but the agent can maintain a model, uh, which would say, I hope I, I'm still sharing, but agent can say, hey, I wanna maintain, uh, Uh, can, agent can maintain a uh, model, okay? And this is an example model. This is basically transition probability matrix. I think uh, we have seen something like this before. It's basically given a state, given an action. You remember, environment has to say, given a state, given an action, tell me what the next state is and tell me what the next reward is. And this is just a way to quantify that. So this is an example of a model a representation of, uh, um, you know, for example, how can I, you know, just to kind of uh, a teaser, if an agent already knows, uh, you know, if this is the how the environment behaves, then agent doesn't even have to interact and learn. Agent knows everything about the environment. If, if the agent already has access to these, then the problem just becomes an optimization problem. Okay. Given these model dynamics, given these reward functions that you already know, can you tell me what is the best sequence of actions, best, uh, you know, actions taken every every situation, right? So that's, a, that's actually the MDP optimization problem. Okay, so these will be a part of the MDP definition. And then your optimization problem will be just trying to figure out what is the best thing to do. Even if I told, even if I tell you this is how, let's say the environment behaves, okay. In the RL setting, you don't know this uh, a priori. You can certainly try to learn them and then solve the MDP problem, MDP optimization problem offline. Uh, or, you know, you can keep learning and doing some uh, actions based on it, okay. How many people are lost at this point? Okay, so what is confusing about uh, a model? It, this, by the way, the, the three components that I saw, saw policy, value function, and uh, model, 
not all three are necessary to define an agent. Okay, I'm just saying that some some agents or some you know solutions can only you know at the end of the day every solution has to say what is the policy, which is every state what are you going to do. So policy is kind of essential. The value function and model is just you know some some agents may say hey let me reverse engineer by just interacting with the environment figure out what is the what are these probabilities you know how does it change states and how does it give me rewards and based on that I can do some offline computation to figure out what is the best thing to do. Or there are some agents which rely on value functions to figure out what is the best thing to do, or like what is the thing to do in an agent state. Okay, so that's what we are trying to kind of mention here. Any any questions? Okay. So um, yeah, so tie back to the. Uh, uh, this grid example compared to Flappy Bird, it's easier to describe here. Uh, remember that the in the grid in this grid example, um, reward instantaneous reward at any given state was minus one, right? So you remember in the previous slide, a model I said there are two parts: uh, the transition dynamics and the reward. So reward is all minus one uh, in any given situation. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether it's so in any given state, an action, irrespective of what action you take in any given state, you're always getting minus one reward. Okay. So there's no expectation here, there's no randomness. Similarly, the dynamics, uh, yeah. Similarly, the dynamics also are kind of, you know, simple here. In the sense that if you're in, you in, in a state, let's say this uh, white box here, and if you take, uh, uh, if you go east or go, um, go to the right, then the state transition is saying, hey, the next state is gonna be just exactly this box. Okay, so which is like a very, Obvious thing to say, if you're going to be there and take a right, then of course you're going to go to the next uh, box. Okay. So there's no randomness here. Again, it's just a very simple, uh, it's a degenerate probability distribution if you think about it that way. So if you are here and take a right action, with probability one, you'll go to the right. With probability zero, you'll go to top. With probability zero, you'll go to left. Uh, you, with probability zero, you'll go down. Okay. So that's that's the model here. Because there's no, there's no expectations. There is no probabilities here, in, at least in this example. It's just a very simple dynamics. So dynamics, how actions change the state from one state to the other, state to next state. Rewards, how much reward you earn from each state given the current action. Okay. Uh, so this grid layer is literally saying how uh, transitions can happen. So if you're here, take a left, you can go that way. If you take a right, you go this way. And the numbers represent the rewards. There's no randomness there. Again, it's just minus ones, immediate, immediate rewards. Okay. Uh, so those are the three components. I'm wondering if I should give a break now uh, or later. So let's actually take a break now, although it's a little bit early, but I wanna, you know, um, yeah, I think there's a good point to take a break. Yeah. So let's resume at uh, 4.45. Okay, so let's resume. Um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, before we continue with, uh, so what we did is just introduce policy, uh, policy value function and uh, definition of a model. Uh, what I wanted to do was uh, kind of show you how, you know, we saw Flappy Bird as an environment, right? So with uh, some agent playing successfully, and I think uh, the, uh, uh, you know, so the code is also available, I believe, here. But uh, the environment that you will actually use in your own assignment uh, is uh, what is called, you know, it's called gym package. And you can actually invoke any uh, environment, any game, uh, game typically, and you can inter interface with that and define your agent. Okay, so if you have a policy that you've already prepared somehow, then this is how you can you can. Uh, uh, interact right so for example so this is i guess lunar lunar lander so you can say okay you start with some initial observation okay and say hey given this observation or basically some sort of a state okay you can say hey what's my policy uh given the state i'll take some action and then you give that action to the environment okay so so it, this is a very you know template thing very similar to n.module. module so there's a very uh, particular way you kind of do it with this package so 
so you give it the action and i'm going to ask it to make us you know um, take a step okay so a step just means it's gonna say okay previous observation something you gave me some action here's your new observation here's your new reward and did did you kind of get killed or something for example in games you you're done um and some extra information okay so and so if you have actually gotten killed uh, for example or you know you, you lost then uh, uh, you can reset the whole thing and again continue the whole process okay so this is how you would actually so what's missing is this okay so whatever rl stuff that we do eventually we'll just come up with a function that function is a mapping from observation to actions it could also uh, be that you can do additional things for example if here in this case there is no learning happening you already have policy and you are just uh, um uh you already have a policy and you are just uh, applying it to the environment to kind of see how well you are doing how well you are landing for example if you have to land between these two flags you can you know push yourself left and right and you know and so on so that you can land properly right so uh so that's what's happening here in this short example you can try it out uh like pip install gym or something like that and and try this out uh but if you want to learn then you will have to start collecting hey what happened previously what reward did i get you know based on that maybe i can figure out that maybe in this observation or in this state taking certain actions is bad or good there's some extra stuff that you need to do that's not being shown here but here is just showing if you already had a policy how would it perform okay so you can always write a rule based policy or something which doesn't depend on data okay so maybe you know the domain knowledge that hey if the if the in this case the spaceship is turning like this let's do a little bit of uh, turn that way or go left or go right if you if you hard code it then you can just see how well it performs okay um so this is the thing that you'll use even in your assignment so just wanted to point it out um and uh, the second thing i want to briefly mention is that pytorch itself has a, a tutorial on reinforcement learning in fact this is the agent that will be, is part of the third question in the assignment so uh, although we are not using this particular uh, okay so this is the agent and this is the environment that we are going to use in the assignment uh, but we are going to use a, a slightly different implementation so you can certainly look at this implementation if you want and we'll discuss this not now not today but potentially one or two weeks later potentially next week maybe uh, two weeks from now but this is relevant to your assignment uh, you know three weeks later submission okay. so this is an example that's listed in the in our course uh, lecture goals link you can just pick the link from there the last one is actually in pytorch's uh, repo github repo uh, there is actually a folder so the examples folder has a lot of examples okay so for example if you have not seen it gan um, imagenet mnest uh, regression uh, other things so reinforcement learning is a folder inside inside the examples folder of pytorch and inside that you have uh, two implemented algorithms for doing reinforcement learning it's just that and both of them i, I believe work with uh, the cart pool thing we were just seeing uh, i believe um, yeah so they they use cart pool uh, environment to kind of show how this particular algorithm works uh we will not have time to talk about these two other algorithms but they are algorithms for doing reinforcement learning we are stepping few a few steps ahead if you are interested in knowing uh you know not just the content for today which is the foundations of you know talking about reinforcement learning but also directly get to the algorithms it's a good idea to start with this or the uh, tutorial here which is a different algorithm okay? so there are three algorithms in the pytorch official documentation itself okay so two named here and then one in the tutorials all of them kind of use this uh this package uh gym package and we'll also be using that in our uh in the assignment okay any any questions here yeah so we are not defining any environment you are not defining your own environment here we, yeah this this thing gives you several environments to play with yeah so how do we define it uh, you know you're, you're an agent you can define environment like for example if you want to create a robot which walks on the uic you're not going to define uic right you will just make the robot learn by hey if i take a step like this am i reaching the goal or not uh you know that should be feedback from the environment but you don't get to define the environment you can define the environment okay so let me take that back you can define certain environments um uh in simulation like like you can define your own thing like this but in um uh, uh but okay so let me uh, rephrase so gym provides a bunch of environments that you can interact with as an agent so your pro your problem there then just becomes collect states collect rewards 
based on that do some learning so that you can actually do better and better take better and better actions okay but if you are in a situation where you have to define an environment and define the agent then that's two different two kind of related problems right define the like if you don't if you want a simulation of uic campus then you probably want to represent it in your computer for example let's say you want to do some virtual learning uh, sorry simulated learning then you have to have a, you need to define an environment yourself right that's a kind of a not very specific to rl agent uh, itself right developing itself it's like how how can you get a simulated situation which is as realistic as possible otherwise you can use the uic real uh, campus itself but you know then you'll have to instrument the agent to actually move around or whatever if, if you're doing robotics for example does, does it clarify your question yes. so the bots that we have yeah. So they are also. Uh, they are not reinforcement learning agents. They are not exploring and exploiting anything. Uh, they are just following a policy. Yeah. They just they are. So decision making is all about you know taking a decision given a situation, right? So these bots that you see on campus, they're just looking at uh, you know pathway. Are they, are they on the pathway? Is there an obstacle? If not, just proceed to the goal, right? So its policy is defined. So they are basically in this situation. They are seeing something. Based on that, they are just taking an action: go forward or not go forward. Right. Or, you know, maybe there's also some changes in the uh, route, but that's what's going to, that's what's happening. They're not learning at this point, I believe. But there is no, there is no reward that they actually. To learn the policy, there must have been some reward maximization that already happened. So here, once you already learned the policy, there's further, you know, that policy is supposed to maximize some, you know, it's supposed to collect as much rewards for you as already, but, uh, their reward is basically not, you know, get stuck, don't delay too much, or you know, things like that, right? So um, that all those considerations, uh, those reward signals are kind of irrelevant when you already figured out a policy, right? So here, for example, you can see that I already have a policy. I'm generating a getting a reward for taking an action, but I'm not using it. I'm just doing a for loop over again and again, and I'm just supplying my policy. Right? It's like after being after learning something, you're not going to reuse training signal. But the signal is needed if you want to kind of keep improving your policy. Some learning needs to be there. That's what I was mentioning earlier. That's not shown in this minimal example. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's come back uh, to where we left off. So what we did so far is briefly discuss complex decisions, discuss the RL environment, and then we discussed the three uh, kind of ways of defining an agent uh, three three things which are related to each other and can help define the behavior of an agent policy which is kind of here you know which is you know what to do when you are in a um, what to do when you're in a different state or different situation the second thing was a value function which is the sum of rewards uh, total expected sum of rewards okay uh, which is a which is a new concept basically you know the whole this whole lecture is all about trying to get familiar and more uh, you know comfortable with that value function idea okay and the third thing is a model you know whether the environment you know uh, you know how the environment changes as you make as you take actions uh, whether you represent it as transition probability function or the uh, or the reward function it's up to you i mean it, in reality maybe the environment is like that if not you can approximate it that way that's uh, up to you so those are the three uh, com components that we've seen. What we're going to do now is uh, inch towards um, Markov decision process and the notion of a state action value function. So, so far what we've seen is just the state value function. So just given a state, say it's what's the value of being in that state. Okay, some number, uh, kind of high number means better, better state to be in. Okay, uh, that's the value of that state. So there's a slight variation called state action value function, um, which, is, uh, which we'll get to when we get to the definition. And that's that idea is used, uh, you know, learning that is what uh, an algorithm called Q learning algorithm does. Okay, so Q learning algorithm eventually tries to say, hey, in different situations, what action is big. But to do that, it maintains the maintains what is called a state action value function or an estimate of a state action value function. Okay? So that's why I said when you define an agent, the agent can keep learning policies and iterate, you know, policy one, policy two, policy three, and so on as it sees new observations and rewards. Right, or the, the agent could uh, keep track of a value function, estimated value function, and keep updating it based on its, its experiences of getting rewards in different states and so on. But at the end of the day, it has to uh, take actions so that they uh, they so they are good actions in the sense that they ex maximize expected total rewards. Okay. 
Okay, so now we'll actually go back to some uh, basics. So um, policy, as I said, it's, a, it's represented using pi. Uh, it's a conditional probability of action given state, if you want to think of a stochastic policy. Value function, uh, again, a subscript pi means given a policy, uh, the value of being in some state. Okay, so given a policy, value of being in the, the same state could be different, right? So some policies uh, may be going through that route, some other policies may be going through some other longer route then depending on the policy, the value of being in a state may be good or bad. Okay, if you think of this grid, grid example. A model is this, basically a transition probability matrix. That's what it is, a transition probability function, which is like saying, hey, given state S, taking action A, what's the probability I'll get to some new state S prime? Okay, that's, that's what this function of this object is. Similarly, this function is just saying, hey, in a state S, if you take an action A, what is the expected reward I can get? Okay, that's the script R object. We'll kind of revisit all three in the framework of, uh, I'm calling it framework, but it's just a setup. It's just a, you know, how you define a bunch of random variables, how they're related to each other. Okay, so that's called Markov decision processes. I will talk about why it's called Markov or why it's called decisions, why it's called processes in a second, uh, as we briefly build out, build this whole thing up. And then once, you know, so today we'll not be seeing any, any algorithm, although in the, just right after the break, I said there is the active critic reinforce that I saw, we saw in the PyTorch examples folder or the DQN thing on the PyTorch uh, tutorial um, thing link. We'll not look at any way to kind of actually build the agent. We're only just building up the terminology so that we can talk about um, a potential algorithm Q learning uh, by the end of this uh, lecture or on the next lecture. So, Okay, so towards a Markov decision process, as I said, uh, we're gonna really understand what Markov decision process mean. Uh, they are useful, useful, their utility is just basically that they can, they're useful to describe the RL problem. So maybe the RL problem in the real world, there may not be a Markovian uh, you know, behavior. For example, maybe all the previous things influence uh, what the next state you need, what next state can happen, for example. Okay, but you know, you can always, you know, whether real world, whether it's Markovian or not, you can always say, hey, I want to assume that, you know, I want to approximate it by a Markovian uh, dynamics, for example, right? So MDP is just a useful way to describe the problem uh, because it, it gives you some uh, foundational, you know, objects with which you can define a new technique. Okay, so you can define a solution approach, sorry, new, new technique. Uh, the solution approach that we'll be aiming towards is Q-learning and DQN, okay, in the next couple of lectures. Um, so let me let me say again, you know, as I said, I introduced RL problem. I said these are the components right before the break. I'm going to introduce MDP as a way to just re, re talk again about the same components, policy, value function, model. Uh, but it's going to be a little bit more grounded with some uh, equations, okay? So that, that now we can actually relate, uh, for example, how a model influences a value function, how does the value function relate to a policy, and so on. Okay. Um, so the way we're going to do it is uh, slowly build it up. Okay, so Markov decision process, you know, definition itself has, has a is a little bit hairy. So what we'll start with is a simpler thing called a Markov chain or a Markov process. Okay, Markov chain and Markov process. You might have seen it before if you if you have looked at Markov chains before or hidden Markov models uh, if you are doing um, a five twenty five. But we we'll look at a Markov chain uh, and then we'll add rewards to it. It's called it's going to be called a Markov reward process. And then we'll add actions to it and it'll be called a Markov decision process. Okay. So it's really a three-step you know, buildup of like what an MDP is, uh, our Markov decision process is. Okay. Um, so we'll start with the Markov chain and then talk about the other things. Um, so what is the Markov chain or process? So at least in the MDP, there's two words, Markov and process, which will kind of will be disambiguated right now. Process is just a word for, uh, process or chain is just a word for a sequence of random variables. Okay, so there's no, you know, nothing uh, more. It's just a terminology that was used, uh, that is used in uh, uh, probability theory and, and statistics areas. So, so process means a collection of random variables or a sequence of random variables. Markov just means these random variables obey the Markovian assumption. Okay, which just means that um, random variables are represented in capital letters. So this this random variable indexed. So there's a collection of random variables they're indexed by some index index order. So let's say p and p plus one, for example. The probability that this random variable takes a value as prime, given that the um, uh, previous random variable, the previously next random variable, as st takes a value uh, some s, is we're going to represent it by p s s prime. Okay. This probability 
even if you had extra extra previous random variables realized values, it do, it, it doesn't change. Okay, so basically the given the current uh, given the let's say current is uh, let's say index is t, then given the current random variables value, the next random variable taking certain so any any value let's say s prime has nothing to do with what the previous values were. Okay, that's a Markov Markovian assumption. Okay, so so that's why it's called a Markov chain. Otherwise, it's just a I guess it's just a chain or just a process, stochastic process. So if you don't want to assume a Markov uh, assumption, then generally when you have a sequence of random variables, you would call it a stochastic process. Stochastic just means random. So stochastic process, when you hear the word, it just means, hey, there's a bunch of random variables indexed by something like with a time and, and that's it. No other, I mean, maybe they'll say, hey, expectation is uh, you know less than something and so on. But if you say Markov process, then they'll have, they'll have to satisfy Markov Markovian assumption. And we are only talking about discrete discrete time processes. Discrete time just means there's a time index. Some other um, situations uh, have like something called continuous time process. So we are not worried about that. Okay, for this course. Okay. So this PSS prime, uh, which is uh, probably of transitioning from state S to S prime. So in this, so whatever we did about our RL, or we'll try and develop a policy and so on you kind of have to pause there because I just introduced a new uh, setup called a Markov process. And so there's no notion of actions and stuff here. There's no notion of environments, no notion of agent here. It's just collection of random variables because they have a Markovian property. There's some condition probability like this, which pretty much determines uh, everything about this uh, uh, setup, okay? And in fact, the PSS prime, uh, you can also represent it as a, a via matrix, right? So it's just a, it's, this is called the transition probability matrix. So row, row sum equal to one. So, uh, you know, let's say for simplicity, row sum is equal to one, which just means that if you're in like each row just corresponds to some state, ST, ST is equal to little less, ST is equal, is equal to little one, sorry, one here. The probability of going from state one to state one is something, probability of state one to state N is something and so on. The sum of this should be, since it's a probability mass function, it should be, it should, it should sum to one, okay? So I'm making a few assumptions here. For example, the number of states is uh, fixed, let's say little n, uh, fixed and uh, some quantity like little n, let's say uh, 20 or something, then it's gonna be a 20 cross 20 matrix, where each row is just a probability mass function saying, hey, th given the state, what's the probability of going to state one? What's the probability of going to state two and so on? Okay. So any questions about Markov chain uh, or is that clear? So this is one, you know, this is, you know, it's making some assumptions, right? Finite number of states, discrete time nature and things like that. But I think this is a, gives you a good sense of like what a Markov chain is. They're all variations uh, you will see in other more engineering and other uh, more advanced textbooks, but uh, we can work with this for now. Okay, so let's, uh, so that was the definition. So let's actually just look at our example so, so that we can, uh, uh, get a sense of uh, what a, you know, further sense of modern Markov chain is. One important property of Markov chain is a completely autonomous thing in the sense that uh, if you have a sequence of random variables, let's say they're a finite sequence, let's say 100, 100 length random variables. Okay. You can say, you can start the chain in the sense that you can say, hey, let's say, let's say the first random variable takes some value. Okay. So maybe you say that, hey, the first random variable took some specific value. Then autonomously, all the other random variables can get realized, right? Because you have this transition probability, which will say, hey, given the previous value, what's the probability of any one of them happening? You know, so you can sample from that and you get some realized value. So you're not doing anything more, you know, you're, you're not intervening anymore. So it's just autonomously getting realized uh, collection of random variables, these values of the random variables, right? So what is this diagram here? It's just a pictorial representation of a Markov chain where the circular things just represent uh, um, values, uh, state values. Okay, so state can be this any. So let's say we have st as a as a current random variable. That random variable can take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven values. Okay? So why the why is one of them looks like a square is because it doesn't seem to have any outgoing edges. And I'm talking I'll talk about the edges in a second. Okay. So these are the values that any of these random variables can take. Okay. Let's say these hundred random variables are set. Any one of them, any one of them, let's say ST, capital ST, can take any of these uh, six or seven values. Now, what is edges? They're just saying, hey, if you are if your ST is there, let's say if you're in class one, then it's just saying the probability of you know ST plus one taking uh, the value Facebook is 50%, 0.5. 
and uh, probability of sp plus one taking value class two is 0.5. It's just a vectorial illustration to say that from uh, if st takes a value class one, then st plus one can only take two values, Facebook and class two. It can all the other probabilities are zero, so it cannot transition to these other values. Okay, so that's why this graph. This is a graph with a bunch of edges. The edges are just denoting this. When when can when can a potential transition transition happen and with, with what probability? Okay. Uh, if it, if if you know whether the transition is possible and with what probability? Okay. So here are some realizations. So if you sample some episodes, okay. So I'm using the word episode here, and you'll see the word episode uh, appear in reinforcement learning context quite a bit. Uh, episode just means uh, you start from start the chain, you trigger the chain from some starting state, for example C1. Episode just means you kind of keep hopping around autonomously till you hit some end condition. Okay, end condition is exactly, for example, sleep. After sleep, once you hit sleep uh, state value, there's no transition, you know, kind of, you can't jump out, right? So that's like, it's like saying, hey, sleep, 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 sleep forever, right? So, uh, so that, you know, that chain up to, for example, sleep would be called a, an episode. Okay. Or you can also terminate episode. You can also say, hey, what the first 10 values, that's an episode, okay? Um, so here are some realizations, right? Class one, class two, class three, uh, pass and then sleep. And then, uh, you know, there's for, for example, class one, class two, class three, uh, pub, class two, class three, pass and sleep. So these are just realizations of these uh, Marco chain. Okay. Um, any questions here? Yeah. Circles are the values that any uh, state, uh, so yeah, circles are the state values, yeah. And these are realizations that state values, these are the exact state values. So for example, think of C1 as like S, S0, or not S0, let's say S1 is taking C1, S2 will be FB, S3 will be FB, F, uh, sorry, S4 will be C1, S5 will be C2 and so on, yeah. This is just a state space, okay, it's called a state space. Okay, the set of values that any state random variable can take uh, uh, is called the state space. It's not expected that all random variables take the same collection of you know state values, but for simplicity, let's say each one can just uh, take any of these uh, seven values. Seven values. Okay. So, so since since I said these are the states, uh, so state values. Sorry. Uh, so if the previous state is C one, as I said, you can only go to C two and uh, F B states uh, state values. Take so the next state can only next state random variable can only take. Uh, point you know C two state value and uh, F B state value with these two values, so they have to those them has to be one. So you can see that if you if you are in the sleep state, S T is the sleep state, then there is no next state. You basically have to continue to be in sleep state. Okay. Uh, so this is the transition probability matrix. So this pretty much characterizes everything. Uh, pretty much everything. I I say I say pretty much everything because you still have to say what is the first state okay? because first state is not really a transition state, right? Uh, you know you cannot get it from here. So maybe you say the starting state, it has its own PMF. Okay, I can, maybe I can start from class one with some probability. Maybe I, I start with class two with some probability and so on. So there'll be some marginal distribution over these state values. And then this transition probability completely defines what a Markov chain is. And, and so, uh, so this is a starting object, it's a warm up object. Now what we're gonna uh, do is add something extra to it, which is rewards. But before that, I wanna mention two connections. One is Markov chains are useful for uh, other, other uh, settings. One of the key settings, um, did I say two? Okay, one of the settings is uh, um, that it can be used for uh, sampling. Okay, so which is um, basically, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Gibbs sampling or Metropolis Hastings sampling and so on. So there's some collection of techniques called sampling techniques, which are useful for uh, sampling from a distribution. Okay. Um, you may say, hey, well, how difficult is the sample from a distribution? I have numpy dot random dot random, for example, or just random dot random, things like that, right? Those are those utilities that you have with random uh, package or numpy package. They are fine, but they are they only make sense for uh, simple um, univariate uh, distributions or even multivariate distributions. So, yeah, like, right? If you have a complex distribution, okay, where one coordinate is like uh, maybe categorical, the other coordinate is like some you know bimodal distribution, you know marginal. If you think of the marginal distribution. So sometimes the distributions are kind of complex. Okay, um, for those sorts of distributions, um, uh, sometimes it's even it's, it may be hard to directly sample from them. And so Markov chains provide a way to 
generate samples from these types of distributions uh, by doing some, you know, um, by doing some tricks, which we'll not get into. Um, so what happened is, hey, you want to sample from a, a this complex distribution, probably must sorry, probably distribution. What you'll do is you'll construct a Markov chain, keep sampling, keep keep running the chain like something like this. Okay. Um, here the chain values are like uh, some, some fixed, uh, you know, number, you know, names here. But in in the Markov chain that we'll construct, there'll be some vector, for example. Eventually, the vector will start looking as if it's coming from the original complex distribution. So that's the so although we are running a chain, after running the chain for some time, a Markov chain for some time, a, a properly constructed one, which is what Gibbs sampling does, by the way, Gibbs sampling or metapolarization and all that. They all construct some chain and start sampling from the chain such that after some time, the vectors that you're sampling, uh, vector that you're getting via running this Markov chain, look as if they they pretty much are from the original distribution. Okay, so it's basically a way to sample from complex distribution. Um, it's uh, it's also useful in graphical models, but we have not seen graphical models uh, here, so I will skip that. Um, so, any questions about Markov chain? Okay, um, there are a lot of other technical questions that you would you would want to think about. For example, uh, people think about what is called a steady state. Is there a steady state um, uh, distribution for this Markov chain in the sense that, um, like you know, it's flipping around between the all these values? Is there a is there a you know like after I run it for like hundred million hundred million steps, does it converge to some like you know same pattern of visiting different states? Okay. So in this example, actually, it's not the case because irrespective of where you start, eventually you'll always get to sleep. So the limiting distribution is you know, zero, 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 and sleep has a one, you know, uh, unit mass on it, okay? But if sleep was not there, okay, like let's like say this last uh, state was not there, then given this, uh, let's say six cross six matrix, there's a way to think of, does this Markov chain have a steady state? Okay, uh, sorry, uh, steady state distribution, which is a, which is like a, after some time, you'll kind of see the same proportion of being in one state or the other. Okay, so that's a steady state distribution. So those types of properties are studied uh, for this and it approximates some, it's useful in some applications by itself, not just for the sampling thing that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So any questions about Markov chains? Okay, so, so coming back to our topic, what we did is as I said that we, we were gonna introduce Markov chains, then we're gonna introduce Markov reward process, and then we're gonna introduce Markov decision process. Okay, so there's a three-step process. So we are now touching the second step, uh, which is now we're gonna add an extra item, which is reward, okay? So a Marco reward process is just nothing but a Marco chain with uh, uh, reward values, okay? So, so Marco reward process is, now we are talking about how to represent that, okay? How to use a language, uh, like a more professional language to talk about a Marco reward process. So it's a tuple. Okay, uh, it's a tuple just like, you know, your tuples that you see in your Python uh, notebooks. So it's a tuple of uh, a state, a, a, a set of states. Okay, this is the state space, um, a transition probability matrix, a reward function, and a discount uh, factor. Okay, so what is new here is in the red. Okay, so the red part is new for Marco chain with rewards or Marco reward process. If this red part was not there, Okay, this red part was not there. Then the collection of states in the transition probability matrix pretty much define uh, what is the, the previous thing, which was the Markov chain. Okay, so in the sense that script S is a set of final, you know, finite set of states that we have. Script P is a state transition probability is a state transition probability matrix, which is what happens next given the current state. And maybe in Markov chain you also want a starting state uh, distribution. But uh, what is new here is the reward function, which is the expected reward that you can get from each state. Okay, so it's a little bit different from or other stuff that we were talking before the break uh, or immediately, immediately after the break. Here, the reward is just dependent on, just dependent on the state. It doesn't depend on uh, actions here because there's no actions. This is a, again, new setup. And gamma is a discount factor. You may say, hey, why, why is there a discount factor? We'll look at discount factor in a second. But at least the rewards are just saying, hey, the chain is evolving like in the previous setting, uh, right? So you're going from class one to class two to class three to pass and sleep. So it, it is, you know, whichever state you are in, there's gonna be some random reward that you'll get. So it's like a bunch of numbers, uh, some extra numbers spitting out at every, every time you kind of change your state or every time you, you know, uh, obtain a new state value, okay? 
Um, so, so because they're extra numbers, as it, it's completely, it's still autonomous in the sense that we're not doing anything. Like uh, all we added is, hey, you know, as the chain evolves, as in the, as as the chain's values realize, there's some extra numbers that are being split up. Uh, because we have this extra thing, which is a reward function. Every every situation, it will tell you what is the expected reward at that state. Um, what you can do is now define a what is called a return uh, random variable. Okay, return random variable is uh, we're going to use a capital G to re represent that. That random variable is just going to be uh, the total reward. Okay, total reward starting from the time step t. So G, let's say you're, you know, remember the chain uh, ran, one of the generic uh, chains random variables is ST. So I'm just gonna index a return uh, random variable GT at the same time step. It's just, it's the sum of all the rewards that I can get from that point onwards, basically, okay? Um, in the sense that remember chain is evolving by itself, right? So starting, given the starting, uh, let's say class one, class two, class three, class four, whatever the values, it'll, it'll just take whatever, it, you know, as the chain evolves. As the chain is uh, realizing the values, it will also realize some reward numbers. All you're saying is the return at uh, return, because these rewards, by the way, themselves are random variables. So the sum of a bunch of random variables is also random variables, and that's why I'm calling it a return random variable. Okay? It's just the sum of these rewards from that point onwards, that, that time index onwards. And the sum, uh, because you know, if it's a bunch of numbers, they can blow up to infinity. For example, if the chain never stops, so that's why we're adding a extra uh, discount factor. Okay, whenever we are doing the sum, it's just a discounted sum. Okay. Uh, so basically, you can think of if the chain is if remember if a Markov chain uh, doesn't have a, is not transient. Okay, so I didn't I use I'm using the word transient for the first time, but basically, if the sleep thing was not there, then the chains may be jumping around forever. So which, you know, if it's jumping around forever, then you keep getting some rewards, some realization of rewards again and again and again and again. So that sum is gonna go to infinity, okay? If you keep adding rewards, it's like a counter which never uh, stops, then you can go to infinity, right? So instead of that, if you add an extra discount, then potentially it can be finite. Okay? In fact, uh, you'll see that uh, this, you know, discounted sum generally uh, gives, you know, generally are upper bounded, okay? In the sense that they are, uh, finite lead to finite sums, okay, and that is kind of clear, right? So I'll tell you in, in the sense that, um, for example, if each of the reward is upper bounded by, uh, let's say, value one, for example, then this sum, for example, uh, you can always replace the upper bound value. Then you'll have one plus gamma plus gamma square plus gamma cube. If you remember from your uh, series uh, kind of formula, um, this one is one by one minus gamma or something like that, right? So it's a, it's, it's a finite number. So of course, if the gamma is very, very close to one, then it's a number is large. If gamma is actually one, which you're not discounting, then it's less like one by zero situation, then it's your kind of infinity, okay? So it's, discount factor is just to keep numbers. One technical reason for discount factor is uh, to keep the numbers finite, even in a, even in a, I guess, infinite horizon situation where, you know, the Markov chain doesn't stop. Um, so actually the reason why we define return value variable uh, you know, is, is because we want to connect it to a value function, okay? Even though we are, we haven't, we don't have a policy here, we don't have an action here and all that. We do, it's not reinforcement learning setting. Just because we had a Markov chain and we added rewards to each of the states, you know, rewards can realize for each of the states, we can actually define a value of each state, okay? Uh, value for each uh, state value, right? So the value function gives the long-term value of being in state little less. So the, uh, this value is called a state value function uh, and it can be defined for a Markov reward process. And it's nothing but the expectation of the return random variable. So, you know, I'll let us say that this return random variable GT, which is this uh, potentially infinite sum here, expectation of that is literally the definition of the value of being in that state, okay? Being in that state value, uh, like uh, class or Facebook or pub and so on, okay? Any questions about this? So what is this expectation over, right? So this expectation is over the randomness in these, these random variables, okay? The return random variables, sorry, these uh, reward random variables, uh, but it's also over the uh, Markov chain's transition probability matrix. So because, you know, if you are in state ST, 
there's some probability which will go to some other state, uh, S prime and so on. So there's some randomness in how the states themselves evolve. And there's also randomness in the in the reward values themselves. So both both are taken care of in this expectation. Okay. So given the starting state little s, uh, this is the definition of the uh, return. Uh, sorry, this is the definition of the state value function. Any questions here? Or is it becoming too complicated? That's it. It is getting complicated. Um, well, you, you just joined, but what about the others? The reason why we're introducing all this is because if you want to build something like with Flappy Bird, you want to know what is the thing that you're writing, right? You, you will not be able to write that function the, uh, or a way to train your agent to play in Flappy Bird situation, for example, or even card pole balancing. If you don't know what uh, a value function is, right? Because uh, the algorithms kind of use these ideas, okay? Uh, at least estimated value function eventually. But here we are not doing estimation or anything. We're just introducing what is the value function, right? Um, so I think it'll be good to um, go over it. Or if you want, I can repeat it. But I want to understand, you know, is there a value of repetition right now, or should I wait uh, till you guys look at it offline, perhaps? Was it? Wait. <laughs> Wait. Okay. You agree or you're saying? Okay. Um, so maybe what I'll do is um, uh, end the class, not right now, but uh, uh, after a few slides. Uh, because, uh, you know, as I said, we are doing a stepwise process. So, again, to larger context, says uh, we introduced policy, value function, and model earlier, right before the break. Then we said, hey, we'll connect all these together. And then we've slowly started talking about Markov addition process. And, and so to talk about Markov addition process, we started, okay, let's do two baby steps before, which is Markov chains and Markov reward process. Because if you don't understand Markov chains and Markov reward process, it's hard to understand what Markov addition process is. Okay, the third thing in the list. So what we've covered so far is the, what is the Markov chain. We want to cover what is the Markov reward process. And then if you can do those two, then we can talk about what is the Markov addition process. Okay, so perhaps maybe I will. Um, not cover my prediction process and beyond for today uh, and uh, end a little bit earlier so that you know we can we can have a more informal discussion of you know any of these slides uh, right now in in this time uh, so so with that context I want to, what I want to do is just wrap up Marco reward process okay? because there's one more property that I want to uh, discuss uh, about Marco reward process which is this value function definition here which is the idea of recursion Recursion, something some of you might have seen if you've done data structures and algorithms course. Um, you know, for example, if, if you know the factorial function, you know, factorial of n is related to factorial of n minus one and so on, right? So um, there's a notion of recursion that will be useful for us to uh, develop an algorithm later on, develop a RL algorithm as well as a just an MDP solving algorithm later on. Okay, and I'll tell you what, the, what those two are uh, uh, potentially later. Um, so here's an example Marco reward process. Um, so it's almost the same as before, except what I've added is uh, uh, these red extra labelings. If you remember, um, uh, at any any state, I could I attached a R function, reward function, which is just saying in the state uh, generate a random variable typically uh, with some value. Here instead of a random variable, we're just saying hey in that state a fixed number I'm giving you, which is uh, uh, like you know like minus one if you're in Facebook state. Minus two if you're in class state, minus two in your class state, and so on. Okay. So every time you have that state, one number will be added to your tally. I mean, one number will be shown. You can now tally them together using the return random variable if you want. Okay. So, so let's say this count is one half and uh, starting state is C1. Okay. Uh, and then we run our chain run. Okay. Remember, our chain is just uh, literally, you know, just realization of these uh, state values. So let's say we start with class one. Then we go to class two, class three, pass sleep. Okay, let's say that's our that's that's our chain, and at sleep it ended because you know there's no other transition. I mean, there's a self-transition sleep which you don't care, so sleep is the end. So in that case, um, you know we want to kind of get a sense of what is the what is the written written random variable only because we want to understand whether the state. Uh, if you remember, written random variable, the expectation of the written random variable is the value of being in that state. 
Okay. So our starting state is uh, uh, C1. So uh, the value, uh, so, okay, so not, uh, not that, not, um, okay. So the, yeah. So we're in class C1, uh, starting state. So we'll get a reward, immediate reward of minus one half, or sorry, minus two. So that's minus two here. And then from class C1, uh, we went to C2. So we went to C2. Again, we got a minus two, but we have a discount of one half. So it's minus two times one half. And then in class C2, we went to class C3. Again, minus two, uh, a re immediate reward with a discount of one fourth. Why one fourth? Because it's one half square. And then after C3, we went to pass and then C. So we went to pass. We got a plus 10 reward, plus 10 times uh, one, one half to the power three. Right? Remember gamma gamma square, gamma cube type of thing. And then once we went pass, we went to sleep. There is no immediate reward, which is zero. Okay. So this sum here is a realization of the return random variable. Okay. This this sum here. So minus two plus this thing plus this thing. So it's minus 2.25 happens to be 2.25. Similarly, you know, if again, if I start from state C1 and read the Markov chain run, there's going to be a bunch of some state values it will take. Okay. Uh, you know, eventually the state values, if you need to, you should think of not just these uh, strings or whatever uh, strings or symbols, the C1, FB, and so on. State values generally, generally will be think of them as vectors, okay, state vectors or what is called feature vectors. But rewards generally are always numbers, okay. So, anyway, if you run the chain again, you got a bunch of state values. And then each state, since you visited, there's a bunch of rewards that you collected, and then there's a discount, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteen, and so on. Eventually, you got a number minus uh, three point one two five. Okay. So if you run the chain four times, you got four different numbers. Now what you can do is, if you take the average of these, then that is the value of being in state C one. Okay. Not just the you know that's not the exact value. If you keep you know you have to have to, you have to run the again and again and again and again several expectations because if you remember the definition is expectation of this return random variable. And these are the realizations of the return random variable. Okay, these are the realizations of the return random variable. So ignore the V1, just call it little g1 actually here. Um, but uh, you know, if you average them, that's the value of being in state uh, C1, okay? Any questions about this illustration? It's the same illustration from Marco chain uh, as, as before, but it's just an extra number that's being added. So now I want to talk about uh, one last quantity before we break today, uh, which is the notion of, uh, which is a notion of recursion. Okay. So the nice thing, and, and, and again, we are not related to MDPs or RL setting and all that. It's just Markov chain with a, with a bunch of rewards, Markov reward process. What we can actually do is this value function, V of S, can be decomposed into two parts. Okay. Uh, there's an immediate reward, RT plus one, and a discounted value of being in a successor state, okay, the next state, uh, S, S plus one. Okay, so what we are trying to say is that, hey, you told me that the value function definition for this Markov reward process setting is that it's the expectation of the return random variable, okay, expectation of GT starting from some state S, little s, okay. Now, what I'm trying to say is that this V of S is related to other value function, value function, uh, uh, value functions, okay, it's not value function, sorry, uh, other. Um, uh, state values, yeah. So this V of little s is related to V of other states. Okay, that's what we are trying to, so that's what recursion would be, right? If you think of factorial function, factorial of n is related to factorial of n plus one. By, you know, factorial of n is n times factorial of n, n plus one, sorry, n minus one. Similarly, V of s is gonna be related to other V of s's. Maybe V of, you know, S3 or V of S4, or, you know, some other state values, okay? How is that uh, possible? That's because of the definition of the return random variable. If you remember, uh, and so these four equations here, or five equations here, just showing you how we can get that recursive definition. Okay. So you start with the return random variable, GT, its definition is RT plus one, that's gamma RT plus two, that's gamma square RT plus three, and so on. It's just a definition, second line, okay, of GT. Now what you're doing is taking gamma common from the second term onwards. Then you'll have RT plus two, plus gamma RT plus three, and so on. This dot, dot, dot just means, you know, a lot of terms there up to infinity potentially, okay? You take the gamma common, and that's because if you take gamma common, the remaining terms together form GT plus one by definition. You know, GT plus one is nothing but return at time T plus two, plus T plus three, plus T plus four, and so on uh, with a gamma discount, 
Okay, so we already pretty much there. So we have V of S is the expectation of the immediate reward, random value, plus some discount of a return random variable, which is in one step in the future. Okay, uh, given starting state is there. So given starting state is all, always the same, so you can ignore that. So now this expectation of this plus uh, gamma of this, what we can do is take a part of the expectation, which is only relevant to the subsequent random variables, in and so then we can get a v here so we're going from gt plus one to v here by applying some of the expectation operation uh splitting the expectation operation uh, and pushing it forward okay expectation is a linear operation so if you have expectation of x plus y uh then it's a expectation of x plus y you can call it expectation of x plus expectation of y so it splits okay so it's linear operation so what we're trying to do is this gt plus one you know is dependent on many other random variables right it's not dependent on uh, you know it's, it's not dependent on rt plus one itself okay so what we can do is all the expectations related to these random variables we can move forward and then therefore and then we can apply only to this quantity random variable and so that's why we get a v here okay i'm just very informally mentioning this you can certainly uh, you know explicitly explicitly say what is these expectations over and whether how whether i can take the expectation inside or not but the end result is that v of s is related to a bunch of VFSs. Okay, remember if, if I'm at state S, let's say I can go to from class one, I can go to class two or Facebook. Then what this is saying is the value of being in class one is related to value of being in uh, Facebook state in the next next step, as well as value of being in class one in the next step. Okay, because other states you know are irrelevant. They they you know they are they're not going to happen in the future. Sorry, they're not going to realized from class one. Remember if, if class one has a, a particular transition probability matrix, which is you can only go to class two or class, Facebook. So what, what that recursion formula is saying is that the value of being class one is related to the immediate reward that I get from class one, plus some discount of the value of being in class two and value of being in class Facebook. Okay, So some recursive relationship between these values that I'm computing. So it's it's actually you know non-trivial, right? So you're saying, hey, I can attribute values to different states, and these values are actually related to each other. And you know, it's trivial and non-trivial in, in, in a way because it's trivial because clearly each of these values are just sums of random variables. So each one is kind of pretty much the sum of the same return random variables. So of course, uh, sorry, um, each one is sum of a bunch of reward random variables. So maybe they are all related to each other. That's kind of intuitive. At the same time, um, this recursion here. Uh, is basically neatly splits up, you know, in, you know, it's basically saying that how do I value current state? I can value the current state by the immediate reward I'm getting, plus the value I will get when I jump from this current state to some appropriate state according to the transition dynamics of my Markov chain. Okay. So my Markov chain says, hey, if you're in class one, you can only go to class two or Facebook. So my value of being class one is influenced by the values at these two other states. Okay. Similarly, the value of being in Facebook, being in state Facebook is gonna be influenced by other states. And so you basically have a system of equations of these, uh, uh, of these values of different states. Okay. So, um, so you can actually solve for the values by solving a system of equations if you want, uh, but you can also you know, do other things. So, so this is what I wanted to uh, kind of wrap up with. This, this slide is just showing the same thing as previous slide, which is value of being in a state, is related to the immediate reward plus value of being in future, you know, in values of uh, the state values that you can uh, happen in the in the in one step, okay, and that is illustratively shown either through this diagram as well as below. Okay, so this three, this equation here, this diagram here, and this last equation here, they're all the same thing. Okay, v of s is just saying is some number plus some discount times some over the transition of me going to potential next state. And the value of being in that state. So this is a bunch of line, you know this is, a, this is an equation one per state value little less. So you can get a bunch of linear equations like this. This illustration in the center is just showing hey if you are in value of state s, you can get some reward get to say state s prime and that state s prime there's a value of s prime. So these two will be related. So that's what it's trying to show. So let me stop here. Uh, are there any questions about this part? Yeah, just to recap, let me go back to the, all these, uh, yeah. Somebody said something. 
I was just going to say, uh, where are we, right? So we, in this lecture, right, we, as a, and my objective was to be slow and hopefully it was not too fast. Um, so my objective was to say, uh, in this lecture at the beginning, we saw, we saw complex decisions like um, inventory management and things like that, which kind of the motivation was, hey, even if you have a good perception or prediction uh, tool, like a prediction uh, uh, forecasting model, you may not be able to make decisions that easily. Then we said, uh, there's this paradigm of sequential decision making within which you know, multi unbalanced are the simplest ones and then contextual bandits are the next simpler ones, which only have to do exploration versus exploitation because one, one state to the next is not related to each other. So, you know, you can uh, reorder data if you want. And the version of the sequential decision making problem that we introduced was reinforcement learning, which is where actions can have delayed rewards and actions lead to next state, next feature vectors or next states. Okay, and that's like uh, two extra components. So basically, what that means is that you just don't just have to do exploration exploitation. You were doing before. You have to do that. In addition to that, you can potentially trade off between being short term versus long term. Okay, and that's where the discount factor also comes in. So, so if you um, you can take an action now, which leads to less rewards, so that maybe later on you can get higher. Okay, so that's like the extra trade off that you can do. So we set that problem up, then we, so we define uh, RL uh, as a more enhanced version, more general version of context bandits. Then we talked about uh, how it's different from supervised learning. So bandit feedback, uh, and then this, this trade-off uh, that we, I just mentioned. Uh, so supervised signal is weak, basically. And then we introduced three things uh, that can go into defining a solution for an RL agent. Uh, one of them is a policy. Uh, the second one is a value function. And the third one is a, is a model. Okay, so you can use any of them or three. You can, you know, at the end of the day, you have to define a policy. Okay, whether you can define it, you, it turns out you can define a policy using a value function as an intermediary. And that's why I introduced value functions that, at that time. Then after the break, uh, we kind of looked at um, further formalizing, uh, you know, how to arrive at a, an RL algorithm. You actually have to go through at least one, one route is through mark addition processes. Uh, which kind of further, you know, basically they just formalize what is the policy, how is it related to value function, how is the value function related to model and so on, right? Um, so to do that, we have to define what our MDP is and, to, and, and the step for that is define a Markov chain, define a Markov reward process, and then get to what is the Markov decision process. So we have not looked at Markov decision process today. We'll look at the definition next time, okay? It will just be, an, it'll just be very similar to this, uh, except for there'll be one more, red object, this will be the actions, okay? So um, we'll, we'll start with that next time. And uh, uh, wh where we are ending today is basically this recursion. Okay? So this nice, this idea that value at some state can be related to value at other states. And, and this is just a linear equation. It's kind of uh, the idea behind, uh, you know, solution approaches to RL as well as just solving the MDP itself, okay? So there's two, uh, let me just wrap up by saying the two two problems. Uh, I think the second problem I've not introduced here yet. The first problem is the RL problem. I want to just solve, figure out the policy that gets the most rewards. Right? The second problem is even if I tell you the state transition probability, the reward function, the state, the actions, you still have to compute a policy. That's like our offline problem. If I tell you everything, like uh, um, like if I tell you state transition probability, reward, uh, discount, and the actions. You know that you can that can that's an optimization problem where if I tell you that, can you tell me a policy? Right? That has nothing to do with interacting with the environment because I'm already telling you I'm already telling you what P and R are. Right? So that's that's called solving an MDP. Okay, we have we are not worried about that in our context because we want to do learning. So, but RL problem is where V and R are not even given, uh, and so you have to keep uh, you have to kind of do trial and error just like bandits. So you do exploration exploitation uh, just like bandits to learn um, you know, through the reward signals, what would be good actions to take in certain states so that you can get rewards and hopefully you're collecting more and more rewards as you're learning, okay? So we'll see that uh, uh, these, these considerations next time. Uh, with that, let me end um, uh, and we'll resume next, next week. Sorry, uh, any questions? Okay, let me uh, pause the recording. If there are questions, let's... Uh...